In India today, one billion, 50 million people, three and a half times the population of America, are living in an area only one third the size of the United States. It's an ancient civilization where many people's way of life has remained relatively unchanged for generations. But in the 21st century, a transformation is taking place. With the growing demand for computerized services, millions of jobs and billions of dollars have arrived in India. Outsourcing jobs. 3 million jobs are exporting America. The movement of jobs to India has sparked a heated controversy in the United States. Its negative impact on some American workers has become one of the hottest political issues of our time. Lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. Three to four million jobs. Where are the jobs? But there's another story here beneath the surface. I'm Tom Friedman, and I've come to Bangalore, India, to find out how our new world economy is affecting the old world societies. What happens when the demands of globalization run up against the deeply held traditions of an age-old culture like India's? New York Times foreign affairs columnist. Oh, exactly. That's globalization. Three-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. You're the Tom Friedman. Thomas L. Friedman travels to India. How do you think your generation will change India? To explore the other side of outsourcing. As a foreign affairs columnist and a former international economics correspondent, Morning. I've spent years thinking and writing about globalization. Hi, how are you? But I've never seen anything like India today. It was a British colony for nearly 200 years, so many middle-class Indians speak fluent English, a big advantage in today's global market. Bangalore, located in the center of the South, was the first Indian city to link up with a satellite. Now, it's wired to the world with thousands of miles of fiber optic cable. Today, Bangalore provides state-of-the-art software, cutting-edge research, and backroom business support to many of the world's biggest companies. It's a multi-billion dollar business that's giving undreamed of opportunities to millions of Indians. Good afternoon, Ms. Services. For us Americans, the first and most apparent result has been the call centers. Whether we know it or not, these are the people we've been talking to. Good evening. May I take the number you're reporting, please? May I have the last four digits of your social security? We would be able to go ahead and close out all these transactions. Branch at 74th and 2nd Avenue, a branch at 54th and Lexington. This card comes to you with one of the lowest APR. Without paying even a single penny or a premium. Not a problem, Mr. Jessup. Thank you for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello? 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 The main floor of the 24-7 customer call center is the size of one and a half football fields. Every evening, around 6 p.m. local time, 1,800 young workers man the phones, working through the night, handling tens of thousands of customer service and sales calls from around the world for dozens of multinational corporations. How do you see this job changing their lives as young Indians? For a start, they earn much more than they could have expected to earn uh, anywhere else. Annie Unikrishnan is a personnel supervisor at 24-7. They have a lot of disposable income. And then they have a lot of disposable time because they're working here in the night. So they get to spend all the money out <laughs> in the daytime. Disposable income, disposable time, yes. and 20-year-olds. That yes. sounds like an interesting combination. That's right. They call it hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. This job is hot? Yes. Interesting. That's what they say. Right now, you do not have a good network with your current company. Would you want to go ahead and take a calling card? 120 minutes talk time. What, generally speaking, makes a good call center operator? Depending on the type of product or service that's being supported, uh, the type of employee differs. Bharat Waj is the director of marketing. For a telemarketing employee, one of the main skills that we look at is persistence. Is this just a courtesy call? I'll call back later in the evening. A very dogged approach. Is that because you have too many credit cards or you don't love flying, Mrs. Bell? <laughs> you have um, a lot of customers banging the phone down, so you need right. to be able to take rejection. Yeah, well, so what time would we... Well, Mrs. Kent, it's not a... So as a safety back. Hello? If you're making a hundred calls a day, 95 people bang the phone down on you, right. and you have to do it day after day. I definitely have a bad day. Okay, tech support. What kind of skills do you look for in that kind of person? 
If it takes up a job, you might look at somebody who's more analytical in nature. Start switching between memory OK and memory test. More logical in terms of the reasoning. All right, then let's just punch in three and then press enter. A person who is empathetic. Yes, ma'am, not to worry, ma'am. You need to just press cardinal RETC, ma'am. People who are able to manage angry customers. Yes, ma'am, I do understand that you are in a hurry right now. I'm just trying to help you out. And also, you must be able to solve the customer's problem in a very dispassionate manner. What is the problem with this machine, ma'am? The monitor is burning. Why are Indians so good at all this tech stuff? What's the secret? I think it starts from your education. The education system brings in a lot of peer pressure. And when you have a country with a billion people, that makes the Indian more competitive because he fights for getting the opportunities. And when he fights, he hones his skills in specific areas, like, say, the call center business. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Though demand for young workers remains high, the competition is fierce. Every month, companies hold recruiting sessions, like this one at the Malaysaram College for Women. We have been retained by some of the uh, multinationals here to do the recruitment for them. The primary clients that we are uh, recruiting today is Honeywell and also for America Online. The 24-7 call center receives more than 700 applications every day. Only 6% make the cut. What kind of a job are you looking at? It should be based on uh, accounts, then where I can grow, I can grow in my career. Uh, tell me something about yourself, Vinita. I've passed my SLC with distinction, second PO also with distinction, and I also hold a 70% aggregate in previous two years. Go a little slow, don't be nervous. Be cool. You have to be more confident about yourself when you're speaking. You're very nervous. And I want you to work a little on that and then get in touch with us. I love making new friends. I take uh, responsibilities because I'm the eldest daughter in my family. So are you, you know, uh, open for the night shifts? Uh, it's um, basically a problem in the uh, house. Uh, parents won't allow for that. But right now, you know, most of the people you're seeing around, they are doing night shifts. So do you think you can convince your parents about this? There are hundreds of call centers in India today. They employ more than 245,000 workers. For most of those workers, the first step is something called accent neutralization. For a class, I want you to take out your books. Shara Jose is a longtime teacher at 24 7. Remember the first day I told you that the Americans flap the T sound? You know, it sounds like an almost D sound. And not keep it crisp and clear like the British. So I would not say Betsy bought a bit of Betsy butter or insert a quarter in a meter, but they would say insert a quarter in a meter or Betty bought a bit of better butter. So I'm just going to read it out for you once and then we'll read it together. All right? 30 little turtles in a bottle of bottled water. A bottle of bottled water held 30 little turtles. It didn't matter that each turtle had a rattle metal ladle in order to get a little bit of noodles. All right, who's going to read first? 30 little turtles in a bottle of bottled water. A bottle of bottled water held 30 little turtles. Held 30 little turtles. 30, 30 little turtles. Each turtle had a rattle of metal, had a rattle, a metal ladle in order to get a little bit of noodles. The problem was that they, there, there were Sorry. Because every time they thought about grappling. 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 Grappling with the hag haglu turtles. Their little turtle minds boggled, and they only caught a little bit of noodles. Good. Would you like me to read it? You're from Minnesota. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you an authentic. Yeah. <laughs> A bottle of bottled water held 30 little turtles. It didn't matter that each turtle had to rattle a metal ladle in order to get a little bit of noodles, a total turtle delicacy. Every time they thought about grappling with the haggler turtles, their little turtle minds boggled, and they only caught a little bit of noodles. As I got deeper into the call center culture, I kept wondering how this immersion in Western culture was affecting these young people. I mean, what is it like to not only have to talk to us for hours on end, but to actually try to imitate us at the same time? Check number 665 for $81.55. You will still be hit by the $30 charge. Am I clear? Is this the only telephone line you have at home? Go ahead, turn the computer on. How can I assist you? 
for people of my generation, this is Sorry, something enviable because I got a salary of $100 a month. That's after I'd done a post-graduation wow. with an MBA. These guys get around $200 a month. And they don't have MBAs? No, and they don't have MBAs. Yes. Okay, then. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. The cost of living in India is about one-fifth that of the United States. Okay. Their $200 equals $1,000 a month by American standards. And they're happy to make it, even if it means assuming American aliases for their job. My name is Tom Gray. This is Rachel Smith calling. Oh, my name is Ivy Timberwoods, and I'm calling you from... Has it changed them as Indians? Though? Are they a little less Indian? I was less of an Indian even about 30 years back, because I grew up with Woodstock, I grew up with Beatles, I knew everything that was happening in the America. But here, they are able to go ahead and do something about it. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to buy a CD, I had to think several times right. before I spent that money. And here, they just go to Music World and buy it. So they're carrying their uh, Americanization forward a bit more than we did. Indians have been exposed to American culture for decades. But for most, it existed only as a nice escapist fantasy that had little to do with their real lives. Now, the reality of actually living like the Americans they've seen on TV is within their reach. Just see this, but everyone's got it, no? It's made me feel very independent. And yeah, obviously, I like shopping. Okay, then give me this and the uh, black one. Going out, spending more than we're supposed to be spending. This, it looks pretty, no? After several days in Bangalore, I'm learning that the economic boom from outsourcing is affecting young people the most. And it seems that there is a growing generation gap. This is definitely not their parents' India. Brigade Street is the heart of Bangalore's hip shopping district. Okay, and uh, you have something in this color with the faded. Sophia Ross has been working at call centers for more than a year. Hey, that looks nice. This looks nice, actually. She's 21 years old. A few years back, we didn't have, like, girls at this age working. I mean, they were all probably studying home or getting married. But now it's not like that. You socialize more now. You have the money to go out with your friends. And... You have an excuse to give your parents to say, I want to go out, I need a break from work. So how do you think your generation will change India? India's younger generation is really uh, building up their careers as well as the money. Because Sophia's uh, older sister, Cynthia, is a supervisor at a different call center. Because all you need to do is talk English, the American way, and understand them, and you've given the job. So uh, it's like very easy money. I'm curious, what does it sound when you're speaking more like an American? When we talk to an American over the phone, that's when we open our mouths a little wider, like you Americans do. We open our mouths wide? Uh -huh. Pretty <laughs> wide compared to the Indian. Yeah, the British clothes them are like Scotland and things like that, but American like Scotland. Did I open my mouth that wide? Yes. <laughs> you're not making fun of me, are you? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not <laughs> You guys spend your day dealing with um, Americans often? Um, and you've now got the economic independence. Has that changed the society? How has it affected people here? Yes, uh, we have become a lot, a lot more materialistic because we tend to spend more than what we should. And we've become more brand conscious now mm -hmm. uh, since we started working. Because earlier when we used to go shopping, we never looked for the brand. We just looked at something and we liked it, we picked it up. You guys are the future of India. W what do you think the future of India holds? Yeah, we're going to be a really, really happening country in the future. <laughs> we are changing a lot of things here and there. Our, the ways of dressing, speaking, basically your whole thing is changing. So India is like soon going to be a mini America, maybe. <laughs> so, what are we having for lunch? We're pizza? having pizzas. Pizzas from and we, uh, Pizza Hut, and we also had, think we have some Indian food also. So it's a Christian wedding in a North Indian Tradition, ethnic way, yes. Oh, so he's giving you away. Uh -huh. This is beautiful. Thank you. I wanted to know what their parents thought about changes in Indian society. After lunch, we sat down with Sophia's family. As parents who grew up in a different generation, is there a shift away from the old India where it might be the educator or the guru or the spiritual leader who got the respect? Yeah, in early days, People used to give more respect to the gurujis and teachers and all. But now, it is not like that. Who would you say, f for you, Cynthia, w would be your role model? Would it be uh, Bill Gates? 
or the yogi? Well, it would obviously be Bill Gates. Really? Interesting. Why? He has made a lot of money and a very big name. What about you, Sophia? Yeah, I think even I would follow Bill Gates. <laughs> what would you say? How do you relate to, to this? I don't like to follow Bill Gates. I don't keep him as my model. <laughs> <laughs> you know of course, my girl. God is a model for me. There you can see the changes in the uh, generations. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to summarize the key difference between your generations, what would it be? The generation that was before us, they respected their parents, like, no matter what they said, whether it was right or wrong. But then now, I think our generation, we argue with them. Yeah, we do say no. Maybe from your point of view, it's this way, but from my point of view, it's this way. There may be a change, but still, uh, they can't go beyond the limit. They have to be within the limits. Even if you all disagree a little bit, it's clear to me that there's a bond that runs from this end of the couch to that end of the couch. In India, it's basically family stick together no matter what. The family bond is very, very intense. We're taught to keep the bond. <laughs> we teach our children, learn good things from the people and leave all bad things. Sophia and her sister are doing their best to follow their father's advice taking the best of both worlds. Thank you for being on hold. And balancing the forces of the new and the old. We'll be fixed by tomorrow, the latest of the afternoon. So, Mrs. Toby, the reason for my call today is to let you know that now you're eligible to apply for a free... Nitu Sumaya, age 22, has taken her newfound independence a step further. She recently took an apartment with two friends not far from Bangalore's downtown district. This is the kind of messy. Kitchen? Like it's in uh huh. They do a little Cook on the, bit of uh, cooking. Gas yeah. Stove, yeah. It's a little messed up, but <laughs> this is where I sleep. Great. Uh huh. So you have a sleep bed and everything. Mm -hmm. That's great. Where did you get the furniture for here? Uh, one of my aunt, luckily, she was she going to it? Dubai for good. So we got the TV and the court. Great. This one of As home. she showed me around, uh -huh. I couldn't help thinking of the hit TV series Friends. What do you do for fun? What do you do for entertainment? Is there dating among your age group? I mean, do guys call you up and say, you're free on Saturday night? Yeah, but I think probably most of them without their parents' knowledge. Gotcha. <laughs> so when the parents... They don't know about it. They don't know about it. <laughs> yeah, their parents are staying at a friend's place and then from there. My daughters would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a big difference between your generation and your parents' generation. Definitely, a lot. Really? How so? Our generation is westernized. Parents, they're definitely not westernized. Oh, really? <laughs> like they want me to go home, get married, right. which I definitely wouldn't do. Huh. So they want an explanation. Each time there's another proposal, they're like, uh, yeah, this guy is really sweet and he's doing so well, so why don't you come back? Huh. And most of the time the argument is like, why do I agree? I don't even know the name. I don't know what he's doing. Okay, his father is doing this, that. My <laughs> father explains. I'm like, I'm not marrying the father, I'm yeah. marrying the son. <laughs> So what's it like having your own pad here in Bangalore? It's, uh, we were in the hostel before, all three of us in the same hostel, so... But there we had our restrictions and uh -huh. all that, but here no restrictions. But. Fifty-four percent of India's population is under the age of 25. That equals 555 million young people who are coming of age in an increasingly globalized world. Does that mean they'll really create some kind of mini-America? The American writer Thomas Wolfe in 1940 wrote, you can't go home again. In 2004, though, it seems you can't leave home again. Every place starts to look and feel more and more like America. Is that what globalization finally comes down to? Looking too much only outside your country for growth is not good for any country, and not for India because of its rich cultures. Ananta Murthy, the renowned Indian novelist and scholar, worries that the family bonds that hold India's culture together may be eroding. When these bonds disappear, we may have all the problems that the West has without some of the advantages that the West has, you know. How so? Uh, in India, the family acts like a safety net, whereas in all the rich countries, it is the social security provided by the government. But that social security in India is from the family, sometimes even an extended family. And now it has gone so far, if you are wealthy enough, rich enough, you may send your parents to a an old people's home. 
which I think is there is very uh, sad. Every morning at the crack of dawn, the Hindu nationalist group RSS holds training drills. For nearly 80 years, it has promoted the cause of Hindu supremacy throughout India. Long regarded as part of a radical fringe, many believe the RSS has been the inspiration for numerous acts of violence against non-Hindus. But today, many RSS members reject the violent elements. With 50,000 branches across India, their growing popularity has made them an influential force. That quality of America, we are concerned, definitely we are concerned. We feel that the influence is slowly coming, but uh, we have to fight. Our visit with the RSS was shortly after Valentine's Day, a relatively new phenomenon in India. For example, this Valentine's Day, it is against our culture. It spoils our youths. We are all against it. Love is, after all, it is a spontaneous. It has to be all along the year. Why should we make a show of one day, this lover's day? It's something we don't like it. We went to the local headquarters to continue our discussion with some leading members. I think it's Tom Friedman who writes for the... New York the, Times. You're, you're that, that person? Same I'm, person? I'm that Tom Friedman. Yeah, I have seen because I uh, subscribe to the New York Times. Oh, terrific. I asked them what their main concerns were in India's new era of outsourcing. Because of the call center, there are so many changes have taken place suddenly, even the lifestyle also. They are living with their parents. Now what happens once they come away from their family, they are living in the room or a small house. No space, no time to think about family or nothing. One by one, they may leave all the rituals. In India, all our traditions are kept in intact because of all the rituals. So even though they leave their parents, they should follow all their family traditions. So you don't like this yeah. globalization? The danger it is happening now, mm -hmm. because of the globalization, human beings have been reduced to consumers, and the world has become market. What's the issue with Valentine's Day? RSS supports the Valentine's Day, because it's not rooted here. Similar festivals are in India. If you go to the Kama Sutra, we get the centuries-old sexual pictures and everything. It is not a new things to India. Everything is there. But what is indoor activity, it should be kept indoor. Maybe we should have Kama Sutra Day. Huh? Maybe we should have <laughs> Kama Sutra Day. <laughs> Imagine what those cards would look like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah. For all the joking around, the fact is they have a serious point. If in the process of globalizing, a nation loses its cultural traditions, how can it survive? It will never work. I've long thought that the only solution for developing nations is to do what I like to call glocalize. That means finding a way to become part of the global economy by capitalizing on local talent and culture. A striking example of glocalization is an Indian animation company on the outskirts of Bangalore called Jadu Works. Creating animation on deadline is a high stress job. Each day, employees take time off for yoga. The stretching and deep breathing helps keep everyone calm and alert for the work at hand. And that work is an amazing array of projects. From mosquitoes singing We Shall Overcome in a commercial for bug spray, to cartoon series for the top animation studios in America and Europe. But what I found so interesting is that virtually all the animators here come from a background in traditional Indian art. Many are children of sculptors who carve the statues that adorn Hindu temples. They're especially adept at 3D animation. If we don't transform these traditional skills today, they might actually die eventually. We now get people to think that they can keep the tradition which their forefathers had and just do it into the modern form. Here is the training rooms. Mm -hmm. You can see artists sitting there and learning the digital art. You know, this uh, Raj Gopal important. Iyer, the head of marketing, Animation. explained that these young artists receive six months of training before being put on projects. 
Many have never even touched a computer before. Okay, let's meet Ritwik. He's moved from traditional art to the digital media. Could I trouble you? Would you demonstrate what you've been learning? See, we start off training with a stick figure. First, we do these basic actions like kicking a ball or picking mm -hmm. up a weight. In fact, the principles of modeling is very same as sculpting. You create the character by building blocks, you know. That's well, I thought it was great that these artists were finding work in a new form. I couldn't see how animating monsters in kids' cartoons was preserving their traditional art. So, Vikram, tell me what these people are doing. This is part of the Krishna project that we are doing, and these guys are helping me with the art direction. PC Vikram is director of pre-production for JadaWorks. He explained that in addition to their work for foreign companies, they are creating a 26-part animated series based on the Hindu god Krishna for worldwide distribution. What we are trying to do is work with the stories of Krishna when he was around the age eight. He's a little bit of a Dennis the Menace, and he's the perfect mischief maker. The stories are set in India 5,000 years ago. And where do you get your inspirations for the art? They have a whole heritage of Krishna art, number of paintings that they've had, like in this book here. It's very realistic paintings, the use of color and the way they've depicted Krishna and his beautiful backgrounds. Tell me a little about yourself. Your, your parents were artists? Yes, my mother is a traditional painter. She does this form of painting called Tanjo, and it's at least two to 3,000 years old. Mm. There you go. That's a typical Whoa. example of this art form. It's been valued for its depiction of gods and goddesses. So I do have a little bit of ancestry in art. This is glocalization at its best. Artists adapting their traditional culture for the modern market while creating an economic boom for their colleagues. And not only that, it's also benefiting Americans. For the Krishna Project, the script is being written by an Emmy Award-winning American, and the voices of the characters performed by American actors. All the new recruits get Just like any other company in the new economy, JadaWorks wants the best the global market has to offer. In fact, almost everything in the building, from the computers and the software to the telephones and the air conditioning, was bought from American companies. So what goes around, comes around. At first, I was surprised that even cartoon shows are being outsourced. But these days, what isn't? Welcome to the wide world of outsourcing. Everything from tax returns to credit cards, airline reservations to lost luggage, bank loans to debt collection, the analysis of x-rays and CAT scans to the designing of video games. You know, this is like driving a bungalow. But of course, all of this has been at the expense of some American jobs. <laughs> Accumulated road rage from 10 days here in the traffic. <laughs> As CEO of the Druva Computer Game Company, Rajesh Rao is diving into one of the most profitable entertainment industries in human history. This group here is uh, making a pool game. Is this something you invented? Yes. Wow. This is something that we've made. It's amazing. You I wondered if these up-and-coming Indians have any sympathy at all for the plight of American workers. Raj, what do you make of the noise coming out of the United States now about outsourcing? Do you find that odd, understandable? It is very understandable for a population which is waking up to what I think is the real world. Because the world has changed around you, and there is no such thing as, as barriers to be, you know, to be built that is going to make sense in the long run. So what is your message? Fasten your seatbelts? You ain't seen nothing yet, I America? Think my message is that what's happening now is, is just the tip of the iceberg. Whoa. And get used to it. There's a fundamental shift that is happening in the way people are going to do business and the way people are going to source talents that they need. It's just going to be one global market. And ultimately, it's going to benefit everybody. I give you an example. In gaming. We've never had computer games in India. Security camera disabled. If and when the Indian market opens, that's 300 million middle-class people. Bingo. Nice work, Ethan. It's going to create a huge market for American software because, hey, the Americans, they're still way ahead in making games. And every dollar that people working in these Indian companies earns is going to create prosperity, which means that uh, any global company can come and sell its products here. Just remember that we are 300 million middle class. And it's more than the size of your country or the size of Europe. Raj, I feel a lot of energy coming from your generation. Yes. What, what does that hold for India's future? You know, India is going to be a superpower, and we are going to rule. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Rao's optimism was impressive. But I wanted to find out what a more established entrepreneur thought about outsourcing's impact on America. 
so I visited the chairman of India's second largest IT company, Wipro. The legendary Azim Premji is the richest man in India. Wonderful to be back he believes that innovation is still the key to America's future, and he cautions against protectionism. America will continue to carry the edge on innovation, and I think American companies to recreate a new set of jobs will become even more innovative, but America will continue to take the lead on this. Thank goodness, we'll still hold the lead in something. Which is all the more reason why it's very important for the westernized world to understand that so much of the wealth in the West has also come through access to global markets. You cannot have double standards in globalization. Globalization has to be a two-way traffic. Right. So, I mean, that's a reality. This is the campus of a company called Infosys, though it felt to me more like a luxury resort in the Caribbean than a cutting-edge technology company in Bangalore. It was here that the full magnitude of what the Indians have created began to sink in. My friend, Nanda Nilakani, CEO and president of Infosys, showed me around. So this is a conference room. Holy mackerel. Probably the largest screen in Asia. This is 40 digital screens. You know, we could be sitting here, somebody from New York, London, Boston, San Francisco, all live. And maybe the implementation may be in Singapore, so the Singapore person could also be live here. And you're all woven together at the same meeting. That's globalization. Solutions to their IT problems. These guys have gone well beyond providing call centers for American companies. They are empowering some of the people of India. Many call center workers are using their salaries not only to buy American brands, but also to acquire MBAs or advanced technology degrees. With what seems like a tech college on every corner, hundreds of thousands of engineering and computer science graduates enter the job market each year. Infosys received in a single year one million applications for only 9,000 jobs. Indian companies are relied on by some of the biggest businesses in the world, not only to manage their backroom operations, but to research, develop, and design the next generation of modern technology. In fact, they have become so integral to the day-to-day -day operations of the global economy that they've had a significant impact on the geopolitical conflicts that have plagued South Asia for so long. Last time I was here in 2002, India and Pakistan were once again rattling their nuclear sabers. It got so bad that the U.S. State Department issued a travel advisory. We urge American citizens currently in India to depart the country. Pressure from India's high-tech community on politicians helped to avert a possible war. When you have that kind of interdependence, you can't just shut everything down for a week and go off to war. You can't afford it. Not just because of the impact on India, because it would touch the whole world. Oh, yeah, because you're part of a global supply chain. And tapping into this global network of resources can transform the world. I truly believe that. The interdependence of all this will make the world a much safer place. You touch on something that I've been worried about with young Arab or young Muslim from uh, Saudi Arabia or Egypt, who's having a much harder time being able to participate in this global system. Yeah. That's not healthy for us. I agree with you totally. I think all these young people may be forced to choose a path of alienation. And I think it's in our collective self-interest to make the world a safer place, to make sure that every one of them is able to pursue the right positive aspirations rather than a path of alienation. I've always found it interesting that though India has the second largest Muslim population in the world, numbering more than 150 million, there were no Indian Muslims involved in the 9-11 attacks. But there are plenty of Muslims working at places like Infosys and Wipro. In fact, the chairman of Wipro, Azim Premji, is an Indian Muslim. He believes that expanding opportunities to Muslims in Arab countries not only makes the world safer, but also makes good business sense. One of the things which we are doing for building business with the Middle East is we are targeting Arab citizens studying in Indian engineering colleges for recruitment to work for us as a company back in their countries. I go to these call centers, I meet kids full of pride, dignity, and self-worth. People like that don't plow airplanes into World Trade Centers. Yes, absolutely. The big challenge we have in front of us is create enough economic engines of job creation for all these youngsters. 555 million under the age of 26. At best, we make 4 million, 5 million jobs in IT and, and in BPO and all that. But what about all of the rest? 
The fact is that only a relatively tiny part of India's population has been touched by this economic boom. If you look at all of the success that we've had in our country, a lot of it hasn't percolated down to the citizens. So as a result, primary health, primary education, healthcare, and so on are dysfunctional. Ramesh Ramanathan is co-founder of Janagraha, a citizens' advocacy group. I could take you 100 yards away from here where you could think that you could be in one of the most abysmal parts of sub-Saharan Africa. There is no water supply, no sanitation. There are children who are not going to regular primary schools. This is the same city which is servicing the IT boom. More than 10% of Bangalore's population, nearly one million people, live in slums like this. Many have no running water, no electricity, and inadequate sanitation facilities. Hi. As appalling as these conditions are, these are children of what we would call the working poor. Their parents are just up the street, making their own contribution to the information technology boom. These construction workers are migrants who travel from one job to the next. The women earn between one and two dollars per day. The men, half a dollar more. As I watch this scene, I thought, how can a nation with such vast disparities of wealth and poverty ever truly make it in the modern world? The only way that globalization is ultimately sustainable is if it benefits the whole society. In India, with a population of more than one billion people, that's a tall order. More than 700 million Indians live in villages like this. Bangalore, just an hour's drive away, feels more like a world apart. Indians here have benefited little from the economic growth. In India, if you just go 100 miles out of town, you are 100 years behind. Same thing is true here. It's not here 100 years, it's about 200 years behind. Abraham Verghese is a former business executive and an advocate for India's poor. He worries that globalization is causing villagers to lose what little they have. In this country, the incense sticks are made by women at the cottage industry. They've been rolled these sticks and make five or 10 rupees a day. So there's a company called British American Tobacco brand here. This company last year decided to make and sell incense. So I say, now look, leave this thing to people. And they make five rupees, 10 rupees a day. So this is criminal to, to deprive them for that this company can add a little more of profit. But it's not just the livelihood of locals that can be damaged. Some believe that globalization is destroying the very fabric of traditional Indian society. I went to meet with one such group. Vimochana is a women's rights organization and active in the anti-globalization movement. I know that your institute here deals with a whole range of social issues. We're here focused on the issue of outsourcing. Good, bad, or ugly? I think, yes, in the short run, it is generating employment. But I think in the long run, it's creating a dependence and creating a vacuum in the kind of natural, organic fabric of our societies. I think the issue really is that, how did people live? How is it that certain forms of life have been canonized mm -hmm. as the best way to live? Mm -hmm. There is another legitimate point of view and legitimate way of life. No, which has been delegitimized. People may not be living according to that industrial kind of framework. And let the industrial economy live, no problem. But leave us alone. Don't make us want to live like you. And don't make us feel poor. Mm -hmm. I think that is, the, that is the danger. I think that the only way to preserve the kind of village life that, that you idealize is to have an economic context created there where people can sell their crafts into a global economy and then stay in the village that's what will actually sustain it. No, if it was that simple, but it's not that simple. It's not that simple because if you want to preserve a village, you should just let the village live. It'll mm -hmm. find its own levels of sustainability. Yeah, and what, what it, it does will. is the people no, there will no, come but to no, Bangalore. No, they no, say, yeah, why? We can't, why, why? Why? Because, because they can't survive being left alone. Why can't they survive there? It's because the city has become the model of development, progress, of economic growth, of everything. So therefore, you create economic conditions where you know village life becomes unsustainable. You know, I'm sure you're all wrong, 
But I'm really glad we talked to you because um, I think there is something actually very deep that you're touching. Quality of life, where is all this going? Those are really important. I think you over-idealize village life a little bit. I think it appears like over-idealizing village life because you're presenting us with an over-idealization of globalized life. There is something that is deeply wrong about the kind of globalization that, the, that we're right. seeing today. I think we have to see what is it that we're losing out on. And obviously that sense of loss is being felt. The stunning defeat of the ruling party in India's latest election underscores that India's poor would like to share in the benefits of the technology boom, but are feeling left behind. I kept coming back to what Nandan Nilakani said about the importance of creating opportunities for all citizens, especially young people. Then I got a glimpse of how this just might be accomplished. Never seen a... Lalita Law is the principal of a remarkable school that's located among the villages outside of Bangalore. As we drove there for a visit, I asked her about the students. For the kids in your school, what do their parents do? They belong to the lowest castes of Indian society. They're not supposed to be near people of the upper caste because they will contaminate the very air that they breathe. They're untouchables? Yes, they are untouchables. Lalita, what are the conditions of the kids before they come to your school? They are hungry, they are malnourished, they don't know what it is to have running water. They have to learn how to use a bathroom. I mean, an hour from Bangalore? Yes. From these high-tech cities we've seen, there yes. are kids who have never seen yeah. a toilet? Less than an hour. So this is a school? Yes. This is a school on the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. This place was nothing uh, but uh, inhabited by snakes and scorpions. Abraham uh, George is, is the founder of the Shanti Bhavan uh, School. He's an Indian high-tech businessman who made it big in America. And he's using the money he made in information technology to create opportunities for India's poorest children. Pastor, we'll go to the baby computer class. Who's the fastest typer here? I want to race. Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go. Who's winning? I give up. <laughs> I don't believe that. How did you do that? I got two lines. <laughs> they use uh, software produced in America. They work on Excel, Word, a PowerPoint. It must be an amazing leap, though, for these kids coming from the village to be doing Excel. Right, but. There is no difference between them and uh, any other children. They are, they are just as smart as anyone. Given the opportunity, they do just as well. See, our goal is to have these children uh, break all the barriers, you know, and really be professionals and leaders of the society. What would you like to be when you grow up? An astronaut. Astronaut? What would you like to be? I would like to be a doctor, a pediatrician, a poetess. Do you write poetry now already? Yes. Whoa, that's wonderful. That's a great thing to want to be. Physics and chemistry. Physics and chemistry. Wow. I want to be a scientist and an astronaut, a surgeon, a detective. I would like to become an author. Thank you like to write books. Yes. Why is the success of these kids so important for India's future as a whole? If India is to succeed globally, uh, we have to make full use of the manpower that India has. The high-tech uh, segment today is approximately three million people. Three million out of a billion? Yes, three million. Then what happens to the other people? That's what we are really talking about. So they are the ones that have to do well for India to succeed.